I'm Charlton Heston. I'm particularly glad to welcome you to this program about the miracles of Jesus. When we think of these miracles, we often think of them as supernatural acts, the instantaneous healing of the blind, or the transformation of a small amount of food into a feast for thousands. Those incidents make up an important part of the New Testament. And they're compelling, there's no doubt about that. But they don't tell the whole story. The story of Jesus' ministry is engaging for Christians and non-Christians alike because it depicts someone who, as Ralph Waldo Emerson once wrote, felt that man's life was a miracle. Again and again in the Gospels, Jesus emphasizes his concern for all individuals, regardless of their position in life. In the process, he also maintains his own humility. Take, for example, his comment in the Gospel according to Mark. Why do you call me great, he asks. There is none great but God. That is a remarkable statement when you consider that Jesus has come to be regarded by millions as the greatest man who ever lived. Indeed, over the last 2,000 years, more ink and blood have been spilled over this man than over any other human being in history. Nevertheless, throughout the Gospels, Jesus repeatedly points away from himself and towards the Almighty, just as Moses and all the great prophets had done before him. This story, as it's told here, begins with John the Baptist urging anyone who will listen to prepare ye the way of the Lord. John does his part by touring the countryside and baptizing men and women who've acknowledged their own sins. He also gives us a taste of Jesus' message. John's pronouncements lead some people to believe that it is he who's the Messiah. John knows better, of course. He, too, is a man of deep humility. So much so that when Jesus asks to be baptized, John protests, surely I am not fit to baptize you. He says, you should baptize me. In the end, Jesus gently persuades John to do as he says. And immediately, as Jesus rises from the water, a bright light in the form of a dove appears over his head. It's one of many signs that will convince witnesses that Jesus is no ordinary man. But for the most part, as Jesus travels throughout the Holy Land and encounters small groups of people, he will need no miraculous signs to prove that he is special. He will do that simply with his words. In many cases, Jesus speaks in parables, stories that use symbols to convey a moral message. One such story is the parable of the seeds, which symbolize the potential within all of us. Seeds that are planted in good soil, he says, are like people who embrace the truth. Inevitably, they will flourish. The message of Jesus becomes so powerful that crowds follow him wherever he goes and plead for him to offer instruction or to use his healing powers on sick friends and relatives. The power of his message doesn't inspire everyone, of course. In time, the ruling priests will come to fear him and will find a way to put him to death. where a young carpenter from Nazareth is preparing to answer his true calling. Your guides in this journey will be my friend Simon and his camel, named Gimel. I hope you enjoy the experience. I'll see you next time. Galilee during the Roman occupation. Times are tough, taxes are high, people are poor, and there's not much hope. Help the hungry, help the hungry. Many long for the coming of the Messiah, as promised in prophecy. The people hoped the Messiah would make them free from Roman oppression. <laughs> Out of the way! 
What are you looking at? <laughs> One day, the Messiah will come and change all this. I know it in my heart. Men like Matthew, desperate for work, signed up as tax collectors for Rome. Next. Ah, Simon Peter, come to pay your back taxes? Ah. No, no, it's nothing personal. I'm just doing my job, friend. You're no friend of mine, you blood-sucking leech. No need for name-calling. If I didn't do this, someone else would. How can you tax us when we work so hard for so little? Rome taxes the people, not me. You live off the suffering of your own people. Backstabber, you sold us out. Is there a problem here? Uh, no problem, soldier. Uh, the good fisherman was just about to pay his tax. Very well then, carry on. See, I, I could have had you arrested, but I didn't. I'm on your side. Come on now, pay up. Traitor. <sighs> Prepare ye the way of the Lord. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now there was a man called John the Baptist who lived on honey and locusts in the desert. And he brought to the people a message they desperately wanted to hear. The Messiah was coming. I tell you, the Son of God is coming. So turn away from your sins and be baptized. is above God's law, not the priests who get rich off the people, not even King Herod who defied the law by marrying his brother's wife. He even speaks out against the king. This man has great courage. In Nazareth, there lived a carpenter named Jesus. Your cousin, John the Baptist, is paving the way for you. The people are listening and waiting. Yes, Mother. I know. I don't want to see you go, but... in my heart, I know it's time for you to lay down your tools and tend to God's work. I'll miss you, my son. Turn away from your sins and be baptized. Tell us how. It is not enough to say, I am good and I believe in God. You must demonstrate your goodness by your deeds. If you have wealth, give it to the needy. If you have two robes, give one to your neighbor who has none. And if you have food, share it with the hungry. Teacher, we are tax collectors. What must we do? Don't ask for more than you are entitled to. What about us? Don't use your power to bully people. Tell us, preacher, who exactly are you? Are you the Messiah? I am but one voice crying out in the wilderness. On whose authority do you wash away men's sins? I baptize you with water, but the one who follows me is far greater. 
I am not fit to untie his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Baptize me, cousin. Surely I am not fit to baptize you. You should baptize me. Let it be so. For this way we do what is right. beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. And those that watched this knew they had seen something wondrous. Soon after, John the Baptist was imprisoned for speaking against King Herod. And then Jesus came to Capernaum, a town in Galilee. The people gathered, anxious to hear him speak. Again, no fish. Our bodies ache from a long day at sea. We didn't catch enough fish to feed our families, that's for sure. Yeah. And the tax collectors, they don't care. Even when times are hard and we have so little, they still keep taking and taking. Look who's coming. Hey, James and John. We've not seen you two lately. Where have you been? Following Jesus. He's coming here to speak to the people. First you followed John the Baptist and now this Jesus? Don't you understand? These men can't change the way things are. Tomorrow will be just like yesterday and the day before. Perhaps if you listen to Jesus preach, you'd feel differently. <laughs> Let him preach to the fish and make them swim into our nets then. <laughs> then I'd gladly listen. He's here! Jesus is here! Master, this is my brother, Simon Peter. May I board your boat? Be my guest. The word about Jesus had spread, and the people were anxious to hear him talk. Don't go, Jesus. Speak to us. Please, speak to us, Jesus. But when they saw him board Simon Peter's boat, they were afraid he was leaving. One day, a farmer went out to scatter seeds on his field. Some of the farmer's seeds fell by the open roadside. Birds quickly flew down and gobbled those seeds up. Some of the other seeds fell among the rocks where there wasn't much soil. Although the crop sprang up quickly, when the sun rose, those seedlings were scorched. Because they had no root, they withered and died. But some of the farmer's seeds fell upon good soil, and those seeds produced a fruitful crop. This is the meaning of my parable. The man who plants the seed spreads the message. The seed doesn't take hold on those who hear it on the road. They move on and quickly forget. The seed that falls upon the rocks are those who accept the message with joy at first, but quickly lose faith at the first sign of trouble and the seed that falls upon good soil. These seeds are the people who hear the message and accept it. And they flourish. Push out now into deep water and let down your nets for a catch. <sighs> but there are no fish out there today. We've labored for hours and caught nothing. 
Do as he says, brother. This is a waste of time. As I said, it's no use. Bring up your nets. But do it, brother. Very well. What? James! John! Give me a hand here! Fish! Nothing but fish! <laughs> we never had a haul like this! We've got more fish than the boat will bear! from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. There's no goodness in my heart. I'm not worthy of you. Don't be afraid, Simon Peter. Join me and catch men instead of fish. <laughs> day on, Simon Peter became one of Jesus' most faithful followers. There was a wedding in the town of Cana in Galilee. were the bride's parents. And Jesus and his new disciples came to celebrate too. What do you mean we've run out of wine? Are you sure? We weren't prepared for this many people. More wine, please. My cup is empty. Could you pass the wine? Well, the stewards run out of wine. Well, there's none left. Is that your concern or mine, Mother? My time has not yet come. The bride's parents are my good friends. Why should their happiest day be ruined? Well, can't you do anything to help them? <laughs> Very well, Mother. Gather the servants by the well. Yes, Master. Fill those jars with water. But why? We need wine, not water. Do as my son says. And when you're done, draw some out and bring it to the guest of honor to sample. It goes 
goes in as water and comes out as wine. What's this? Now that's what I call good wine. Mm, quite good. And most men serve the good wine first, and then after everybody's too drunk to care, they bring out the poor stuff. But you, you know how to treat your guests right. My friends, <laughs> a toast to the bridegroom, who saves his best wine for last. When news of this first miracle spread, so did Jesus' fame. As word spread, the crowds got bigger. Unclean! Unclean! Stay back! Careful, Master. That man is a leper. He's warning us to stay away. Don't be afraid. Master, no! Don't touch him! He's diseased! Don't worry, James. He knows what he's doing. If you are willing, you can make me clean. I am willing. Be clean. Look! <laughs> Jesus cured the leper. The Lord's healing powers are with him. You've cured me. I thank you. I thank you. Go to the temple and make an offering. <laughs> Tell no one what happened here. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Praise God! Praise God! I was once a leper and Jesus cured me! Jesus cured me. And the story of how the leper was healed made Jesus' name even more famous. Soon after, Jesus crossed the Sea of Galilee with his disciples. Master, you must be tired from preaching all day. Why don't we rest? We'll wake you when we reach the other side. Trust me even yet. Who is this man? Even the wind and waves obey his order. When word got out that Jesus was preaching at a house in Capernaum, the crowd that came to see him was enormous. Four men brought a friend who'd been paralyzed for years, but the crowd was so thick they had to lower their friend down through the roof. <laughs> Jesus saw that this man had faith. Do not fret. Your sins are forgiven. Blasphemy! Only God has the authority to forgive sin. That's right, only God. 
tell me which is easier to say. Your sins are forgiven, or get up and walk. To convince you that the Son of God has full authority on earth to forgive sins, get up. Pick up your bed and go home. These miracles of Jesus strengthen the faith of his followers. But others saw Jesus as a threat, and they feared him. Jesus saw Matthew, the tax collector. Next. Oops. Follow me. Me? Master, don't ask that backstabbing tax collector to join us. That vulture would sell his own mother for a profit. I tell you, Simon Peter, it's sinners who need the saving, not the righteous. Who needs the doctor more, the healthy or the sick? Yes, Master, but I still say his sort doesn't belong with us. When you first joined me, did you not confess you were a sinful man? And did I not welcome you with open arms? What are you waiting for, then? Come, join us, tax co- <laughs> Matthew. Yes. Yes, I'm coming. Oh, wait for me! Jesus! Came a man called Jairus, one of the temple leaders. Please, let me through, please. My name is Jairus. My little girl is very sick. Please, I beg you to come and put your hands on her so that she may live. Lead the way. So sick, so weak, can barely walk. Doctors, I've seen so many. They only make me worse. If only I could just get close enough to touch his cloak. Perhaps, perhaps then I'll be well again. Just a little closer. Closer. Who touched me? Master, in such a crush of people, you asked who touched you? Somebody touched me, for I felt the power leave me. Don't be afraid, my daughter. It is your faith that healed you. Go in peace and be free from suffering. Please, we must hurry. It's too late, Jairus. Oh. Don't cry, Jairus. The girl is only sleeping. Sleeping? How dare you say such a thing? Now, don't be afraid, Jairus. 
Go on believing, and your daughter will be all right. I believe. <laughs> no, 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 my baby. I'm... My baby. Little girl, get up from your bed. Mother, why are you crying? She looks hungry. Give her something to eat and tell no one what happened here. Not long after, John the Baptist was executed. After spending the whole night in prayer to God, Jesus summoned his disciples and from them chose 12. They were Simon Peter and his brother Andrew, James and his brother John, sons of Zebedee, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas, Matthew the tax collector, James the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon the zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who would later betray him. When Jesus arrived near Bethsaida hoping to rest, he found thousands of people waiting for him. He walked among them, healing the sick and telling stories. Once there was a man who had two sons. The youngest son said to his father, give me now the share of the property that is rightfully mine. So the father divided up his estate between his two sons. The older son stayed home and worked the fields. The younger son left home and lived like a prince squandering his money on extravagant living and gambling. Soon, the country fell into famine, and the youngest son's money was gone. Now that he was penniless, his new friends disappeared. In time, he was begging on the streets. Get a job. A farmer hired him to tend the pigs. And the youngest son got to the point of longing to stuff himself with the husks the pigs were eating. My father's servants have clothes on their back, plenty of food, and here I am, his son, penniless and starving. If I beg my father for forgiveness, perhaps he'll let me work for him as one of his servants. You. Father, I have done wrong in the sight of heaven and in your eyes. I don't deserve to be called your son anymore. Servants! Fetch the best clothes and put them on him. Put a ring on his finger and shoes on his feet. And get that fatted calf and kill it. And we'll have a feast and celebration. For this is my son. He was dead and he's alive again. He was lost, and now he's found!
<laughs> Father, how could you treat me like this? For years, I've slaved for you, and you've given me nothing. But for my brother, who left home and wasted his inheritance, you killed the fattest calf. My dear son, everything I have is yours. But we need to celebrate our joy, for this is your brother. He was dead, and he's alive. He was lost, and now he is found. And so it is that God will forgive those who come back to him with a pure heart. Master, it's getting late. We should send the people home to their villages so they can get shelter and food. There's no need for them to leave yet. But there's nothing to eat here. We can feed them. With what? That boy has some food. Do you mind sharing your food with the others? But this is all I have. I know that these people all need to be fed. But all I have is these two fish and five loaves of bread. Why look at me? What should I say? I'm hungry myself. I haven't eaten all day. It's a very small meal. I brought it for one. And there's not enough here to feed everyone. It's a very small meal. So little to eat. How will it be enough? If I brought some more food along, I'd gladly share This is all I have I can't make more out of thin air Why didn't these people Plan in advance Why did so many Leave their dinner to chance The very small meal I brought it for one And there's not enough here Feed everyone. It's a very small meal, so little to share. How will it be enough? I don't want to be selfish, I don't want to be rude. So many people haven't got any food. I'll share what I of you. But master, as the boy said, there are thousands of people here, and there's just not enough food. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, who has brought forth the fruit of the earth. It's a very small meal, he brought it for one. But from it, Jesus has fed everyone. It's a very small meal. He brought it for one. But from it, Jesus has fed everyone. Jesus told his disciples to board their boat and cross the Sea of Galilee, while he stayed behind to send the crowds home and pray. throwing us off course. What about Jesus? How will he join us? What? What's that? What is it? Who is it? It's a ghost, I tell you. 
It's all right. Don't be afraid. It's only me. Master, if it's really you, tell me to come to you on the water. Come on, then. You heard me, brother. Go on. Walk on the water, son. Don't be afraid. Look! The water's holding him up! Come. I'm afraid. Master, save me! Save me! Oh, man of little faith, why did you doubt? I was afraid, Master. After all I've shown you, how can you still disbelieve? You are indeed the Son of God, Master. Soon after, a messenger came from Bethany to bring Jesus some alarming news. I bring news from your dear friends in Bethany, Martha and Mary. Their brother, Lazarus, is sick. They beg you to come quickly and save him. This illness will not end in death, but will show the glory of God and glorify the Son of God. Bethany is too close to Jerusalem and your enemies will surely stone you. Yes, a trip to Bethany at this time would be like walking into a den of wolves. We all love Lazarus, but it's too risky to go to Bethany now. Where to now, Master? Bethany. Bethany? But Master, only a few days ago, you said we wouldn't go to Bethany. Our friend Lazarus sleeps. I go to wake him. If Lazarus is only asleep, then he is well. No, Lazarus is dead. Dead? But... I don't understand. Master, if he was that ill, why did we wait? So that your belief will be strengthened when I wake him from death. There's nothing but disaster waiting for us in Bethany. Let us all go so we may die together. Thomas, my life is like a day which is not due to end yet. Oh, Master, if only you'd come sooner, my brother Lazarus would not have died. But even now I know that God will grant you anything you ask him. Your brother will rise again, Martha. I know that he will rise again at the resurrection on the last day. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me will live even though he dies. And everyone that lives and believes in me shall not die. Do you believe this? Yes. I believe you are the Christ, the Son of God, who came into the world so our sins would be forgiven. Oh, Master, you're too late. Our brother has been dead for four days. <laughs> Tell me where he is buried, Mary. And many followed Jesus, Mary, and Martha, and the 12 disciples to the tomb. He's buried here in the cave. Take away the stone. But, Master. If you only believe, you will see God's glory. Lazarus, arise! Unbind him and let him go. 
I saw it with my own eyes. He brought Lazarus back to life in the very shadow of Jerusalem. Many saw it. More people follow him with each succeeding miracle. Soon we'll lose control of the people. And then Rome will refuse to deal with us. We'll lose everything we have, all because of one man. Do you see what we must do? One man must die, or the whole nation shall perish. Soon I will go to Jerusalem, and there I will be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes. I will be killed, and after three days I will rise again. If you stay with me, you will face great hardship. So if you follow me, follow me with all your heart, or not at all. Jesus performed many glorious miracles. He healed the sick, cured the lame, brought the dead back to life, and even walked on water. While some misunderstood and feared Jesus, others found their faith strengthened. You are indeed the Son of God, Master. Through these miracles, Jesus revealed his divine glory. And through his preaching, he taught that we are all brothers and sisters and must love and take care of each other. <laughs>